Pavanic of Ardex Americas to present to us uh, for us today. Um, Seth's reputation precedes him, well respected in our industry, very knowledgeable, sits on several uh, well recognized standards bodies across North America. Uh, great contact for future questions and um, uh, what have I missed here? I think that's pretty much it. This session will be recorded. So if you have any questions about access to the recording, you can email us or, or phone us later on. And so without further ado, Seth, I'll hand the uh, mic and the screen over to you. I will stop my share. And uh, yeah. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you and the National Floor Covering Association of Canada for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, as I said, uh, as you said, uh, my name is Seth Pobarnik. I'm the Director of Technical Services for Ardex Americas. And I wanna send some thanks out to everybody who has joined us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to spend a little time with us this afternoon. Uh, as Chris said, we'll uh, like to keep the questions uh, till afterwards. Um, try to go for about 45 minutes or so and let, leave plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. And if um, the questions are still coming after, um, you know, we're finished here at uh, two o'clock your time, you know, I'll be happy to continue to stay on as long as necessary. So again, greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity here this afternoon. We're gonna spend some time on wooden subfloors uh, as well as finish grade uh, panel underlayment. So what we got in store today for you is we'll look at the, just briefly take a look at the entire, you know, flooring system from foundation all the way up to uh, the finished floor covering. Uh, go over some definitions there, make sure we're on the same page with what we're talking about. Uh, then we'll kind of get into focus on the actual wood subfloor uh, itself, the structural um, aspect of it and, and uh, get into some of the key products that are a part of that subfloor, meaning plywood uh, as well as uh, oriented strand board. And from there, we'll get into underlayments. And while we're going to focus on the finished grade panel underlayments, I will touch on um, some of the other under other underlayments that are that are out there, um, you know, such as medium density fiber board, particle board, uh, masonite, um, and we'll also touch on self-leveling underlayments too as a part of that uh, complete system. And we'll kind of wrap things up um, focusing on some of the problems that we see out there and things not to do, you know, with your um, subfloor as well as your you know, finished finish grade panel underlayment materials. And we'll wrap it up with a little Q&A at the end. So to get right into it, uh, we'll start off with the flooring system. And I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some terminology in our industry. Uh, number one, the foundation in a structure. Uh, that's uh, the supporting portion of the overall structure. So examples of that would be a footing, uh, sometimes called a footer, uh, a concrete slab would be a structural foundation, a stem wall. Uh, piers and stilts, uh, then you have um, general crawl space construction as well as full basement constructions that are the foundation um, for the wooden subfloor. I uh, would like to make sure we understand what subfloor means. Uh, and this is a definition by um, ASTM, uh, uh, the F06 committee um, created a standard called F141 and that's uh, terminology. Um, F06 committee writes all the standards for the installation of resilient flooring and thus the F141 is the terminology for resilient flooring and one of the definitions in there is subfloor and that's the structural layer intended to provide support for design loadings which may receive resilient floor coverings directly uh, or indirectly meaning it you know, have an underlayment over top of that before the flooring is installed. So that's your subfloor. Um, and then you have what's called a substrate. And the definition of substrate is the underlying support surface upon which the flooring is installed. So yes, you could have a subfloor that actually is the substrate as well. But you can also have a subfloor that has a, an underlayment over it, such as 
you know, finished grade panel underlayment. So the panel underlayment would be the substrate or substrate and then the wooden subfloor, uh, the, you know, plywood on floor joists, you know, that's your subfloor. Um, definition of an underlayment. Okay, the underlayment material or the underlayment is the material placed under under resilient flooring or other finished flooring uh, to provide a suitable, suitable surface for uh, installation. So if it's a finished grade panel underlayment or if it's a self leveling underlayment, you know, that goes directly underneath the flooring and those materials are, even though they're an underlayment, they're also the substrate uh, for the flooring. So I just wanted to kind of detail that uh, for everybody, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, looking at the flooring system, just as a, a, a quick cross section here, your foundation, uh, you know, that's your support structure uh, for the subfloor. Um, your subfloor, you got um, a joist, wooden joist um, with some sort of panel uh, over top of that, such as plywood or OSB. Then you could have an underlayment over that, and then ultimately the finished floor covering. Taking a look at the wooden subfloor system, you know, that subfloor provides the structural supports for live loads and dead loads, you know, within a building structure. Okay. Uh, the subfloor, the underlayment uh, slash substrate, if you will, provide the smooth, rigid surface for finished floor covering. Just to give you an example here, um, the, the subfloor, uh, you got your floor joists uh, and then sheathing on top of the floor joists. And we have a foundation in this picture, just so we're all on the same page. If you look at the back part of the picture, you'll see a gray material that uh, looks like a stem wall that is uh, part of the foundation supporting that wooden subfloor. Um, more so in the middle of the picture, you got an I-beam uh, with uh, right in the middle, a metal stanchion post that is supporting that I-beam that is ultimately, ultimately uh, supporting that wooden subfloor, those uh, joists and, and sheathing on top of the joists. Uh, so the foundation supports the subfloor uh, and you also have structural supports uh, as well as necessary. I mentioned that the subfloor um, is supporting dead loads and live loads. You know, just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, the definition of a dead load is the weight of the building materials used in the structure, um, meaning the joist, uh, meaning the sheathing, uh, the finished flooring, uh, acoustic uh, tile, sheetrock. All those building materials are what are referenced as dead loads. And then you have live loads, and those are the things that come in and out of the space over the life of the structure. So, you know, most commonly is people and furniture. And uh, just to note, um, you know, most building codes, you know, detail, you know, 40 pounds per square foot load um, in non-sleeping uh, non rooms and then 30 pounds per square foot uh, live load in a, in a sleeping room. Uh, but these structures are designed to support a lot, uh, a lot of weight. Um, want to go into plywood as one of the sheathing materials that um, make up that wooden subfloor. I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, plywood. You can see a bunch of thin veneers in the left picture there. And then ultimately in the right, um, when they're all put together, uh, you've got a series of veneers that actually, you know, make up what's known as, as plywood. And, and we'll get into a little bit more of the specifics here uh, in some future slides. I wanted to first give you a little idea on, on how you know, plywood is made. So we start off with peeler logs, uh, and they also are referred to as blocks. They're um, very large logs uh, that are uh, placed in a lathe. Uh, that lathe will spin that log uh, around in a circle. And there is a, a knife that's obviously super sharp, and you have a roller bar. Uh, both the knife and the roller bar uh, work together um, with that uh, peeler log as it's rotating. And the, the knife being very sharp set at a certain uh, dimension along with the roller bar will equate to uh, that knife you know, peeling thin veneers of that log into what we know, know as uh, the, the sheet uh, plies uh, for plywood. Um, it's typically, you know, 
basically run until that uh, log uh, is nothing left to it. And you have these very long sheets of, of veneer uh, and they're cut into you know, four foot sections very commonly. And uh, then they're dried uh, to a, a moisture percentage of roughly two to 5%. Uh, they manufacturers tend to uh, grade those veneer sheets into different grades uh, based on the result of um, what you have during the peeling process. And then ultimately uh, you have adhesives applied to the veneers. Uh, they're laid perpendicular to each uh, other as um, you're building those plies and then they're pressed together to produce what we know, know as plywood. Threw a couple of pictures in here to, the, to help you visualize this process. The top left picture is a picture of uh, one of the um, peeler logs in, in a lathe, um, you know, with that very sharp blade, that lathe will spin that uh, around, um, basically shaving off uh, this thin veneer sheet out of that log. If you look to the picture of the right, you can see that uh, thin veneer sheet, uh, you know, coming down the uh, conveying system there. And then ultimately it's cut into sections and I threw another picture down at the bottom left there that uh, gives you a little bit better idea of um, those thin veneer sheets being cut into, you know, four foot uh, by roughly eight foot sections there. So looking at the construction of, of plywood, um, very commonly an odd number of layers with the grain um, of each layer at uh, in an adjacency, you know, perpendicular to each other. Uh, very common, you'll see a five ply uh, or a seven ply, and it, it really depends on the thickness of uh, the, the wood that you're purchasing. Okay, taking a look at this a little bit more in depth, you'll, you'll see here the top picture is uh, three eighths inch. We have a garage sale customer coming at some point today. Seven plies uh, for extra strength and stiffness. Uh, you get down to a quarter inch good, it might be five plies. Um, but uh, the bottom line here, when you have an engineered piece of wood here with multiple plies like this being installed perpendicular to each other, uh, it creates a very dimensionally stable material, especially in higher humidity uh, situations. On to OSB, or as it's known as oriented strand board. And I will say this, I wish I had five bucks every time somebody called that oriental strand board. Um, it's oriented uh, based on uh, the way these strands are uh, you know, laid out in the panel. Uh, there's a specific orientation to them um, along the length of the panel. Um, these panels, uh, they look like little wafers. Um, so sometimes they're, they're referenced as wafers or wafer board, but very commonly called OSB for, for oriented strand board. And again, just to give you a little idea on how this uh, is, is processed, it's a very, very high tech, uh, highly engineered material. Uh, they will start off with logs that are, uh, if you look at the left picture, this is a big assembly line here. Uh, but they'll start off with logs where they, um, you know, they peel the bark off and then uh, they have very sharp blades uh, set at certain thicknesses and uh, they create these strands at a very precise, um, you know, length width thickness. Uh, these strands are, are dried out uh, to a certain uh, moisture percentage and then they are mixed with a resin or maybe multiple resins for that matter, depending on the manufacturer. And you know, once that's done, uh, you can see in the right picture as it's, it's coming down a conveyor belt, all these strands with the resin. And, and ultimately, it goes into a, um, into a press, and that's in the bottom left picture. And I mean, these presses are like 2 million pounds. It's, it's, it's a crazy amount of weight to press these strands and adhesive, these strands and resins into a very specific uh, um, a precise and, and specific thickness panel. Um, a lot of weight, a lot of pressure. That 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 uh, press, that two million pound press. You know, it could be six, seven, eight stories high, just to put things into perspective, as seen in the picture. And then ultimately, uh, in the last picture, as it's moving down the conveyor, it's cut into the you know, desired lengths and widths. 
One thing that's very common for um, for sub uh, subfloor installation is that these panels, whether they're OSB, whether they're plywood, they're tongue and groove, and, and quite simply, it, it is just that. You have a tongue on one side and you have a groove on the other, and they pressed into place to help uh, keep the board in place. Um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of an understanding of um, the, uh, the, the rated uh, sheathing stamps that you see on panels. It, it might be a little bit different depending on you know what part of uh, the world you're in, but um, this is just an example. Um, you know, so number one, uh, you know, a key thing that you see on here is the maximum allow allowable on center spacing for the panel. You'll see this, uh, you see 32 and a, and a 16, and the significance of that number is uh, for roofing, roofing applications, um, the, the, the spacing for the joists, uh, no more than 30, uh, 32 inches. Uh, for flooring installation for this specific panel, um, the spacing uh, for the joist, uh, no more than 16 inches. Okay. Uh, you all, before you get to exposure rating, you also see that the right next to the, the 32 and the 16th, you have uh, 15, 30 seconds of an inch uh, panel. Uh, that's roughly, you know, a half inch in thickness. That's the thickness of the panel. Uh, they also detail the exposure rating, uh, such as exposure one. You'll see that. Um, you know, exposure one is 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 basically a the designation for a sheathing panel that can handle being uh, constructed in an environment that's exposed to the elements. Um, exposure one, uh, they use exterior uh, rated adhesives and gluing that panel together, but that panel is ultimately designed for an interior final application. Um, if it had a stamp of exterior, then that, that's, a, that's a sheathing panel that is specifically designed for exterior applications permanently. So you can see you know, some different things in that capacity. Um, the panel manufacturer uh, or identification number is always on the panel as well. Um, from a plywood standpoint, uh, there's uh, various grades. Uh, commonly, you have four grades, but they're there could be, um, with these four grades, A, B, C, and D, uh, there could be variants of those different grades. But generally speaking, we have four grades, um, A being the best quality, uh, the smoothest, the, the least amount of um, uh, knot holes or any type of repairs. And as it goes down to a B grade, a C grade, and then finally a D grade, um, I don't want to say that the quality is the quality is, is diminishing, but the uh, the finish uh, surface is not you know not quite as good, and not all not all applications are going to require you know an, an A finish. You know it all depends on what the need is for that specific uh, piece of plywood, as whether you use a, an AC grade or a CDX grade depends on the use. There are a variety of different uh, veneers. You know, A being the best, you know, D being um, the worst. And when I say worst, it just means there's for a D grade, you can have larger size knot holes. Um, uh, you know, the quantity might be more as well. Uh, some other stamps that I just wanted to make you aware of, um, you know, sometimes you can see on, on these panels, um, the testing company, testing agency that has conducted testing on uh, the panels, uh, you may see applicable standards uh, stamped on there, you know, how the product was built, to what standard, how it was tested, um, that kind of thing. Uh, certainly the exposure classification, we just touched on that, uh, but this stamp actually has that as well. You know, exposure one uh, compared to an exterior, full exterior uh, product. Again, you have the plywood um, or I shouldn't say again, but we have the plywood grade uh, detailed here. You know, the one on the left, it's a C, uh, D grade. So you have a C veneer on one side, you have a D, D veneer on the other. Um, and then the, the one on the right, you have an AC grade uh, plywood. This is an A uh, paintable grade on one side and then a C veneer grade on the other. Uh, so it has a little bit more knot holes and, and the like uh, in the C material. 
Um, panel thickness, obviously, uh, you know, on the left, you see roughly a half inch. On the right, you see roughly a uh, three quarters of an inch. Um, you can have the span rating again, as you see on the left panel, uh, 32 inch span maximum for roofing, 16 inch span maximum for, um, uh, for flooring applications, uh, that kind of thing. So just giving you an idea of what you might see on these panels and what, what it means. Proper storage. Uh, not. Um, you know, yes, these, these products might be classified as exterior. These products might be exposure one, which can handle exterior elements, but ultimately be, you know, used in an interior application. But, but, you know, why, you know, why do what's done here in the picture? You know, you're, you know, you just spent, spent good money for this, this wood, and, you know, we're sitting in a pot of water, um, you know, not, not terribly well. Um, you know, what should be done is, you know, the wood should be uh, palletized so that it's not sitting on the ground. It should be strapped and, uh, you know, have some plastic on it if it's sitting outside for an extended period of time, you know, protect your investment uh, so we're not creating problems in the long run. You know, applications to avoid, you know, you know, what are we doing here? Why, why are we, you know, I know we're not building on a lake, but it sure, sure looks like we're, you know, constructing on a lake here. You know, we got to have better habits. Let's spend some time looking at the subfloor installation. Okay, we have joists uh, that are support members uh, that are on uh, top of a foundation. And then we have sheathing panels that um, actually be our floor surface as a part of that subfloor. Okay, so it's very common to install the uh, panels um, with a long axis perpendicular to the joints, or I'm sorry, of the joist, as you see in the picture. Okay, you should offset the panels. Um, half is the best, you know, if you can, if you can set it up to where you got half a panel um, uh, offset, you know, that's great. But the bottom line is, is we need to have at least, uh, you know, two spans on a panel. Uh, going across, um, you know, two two joist spans. You know, if we only have a single span of plywood and um, you know the or OSB just on that single span, one joist to another joist, you know, there's there there's risk of um, you know damaging that, uh, creating some cupping in the installation. So we want to span at least eight, uh, at least two uh, two spans. Um, typically, uh, we space the panels about an eighth inch apart. Okay, but the bottom line here with all of this information here that I'm, I'm giving you here, it's guidelines, but we, we need to follow local building code. Okay, and, and building codes can change, you know, from township to township, to city to city, province to province, state to state, and, and even be different from the international building code for that matter. Very commonly, these sheathing, um, Panels are installed with 60 or 80 uh, ring uh, or screw shanks uh, from an attachment standpoint. And uh, typically along the supported panel edge, we're going six inches on center. Uh, out in the field, we're 12 inches on center, okay? Um, the bottom line here is, is plywood and OSB has the greatest bending strength and resistance to the flexion along that length. Uh, and that's the reason that we, uh, that we install it in that fashion. I think at this point, it's a, it's a good time to talk about the flexion. Um, you guys may have heard this um, uh, out there. Um, when, I, when I say heard this, I'm referencing the, the um, L over 360. Um, and I want you guys to understand that L over 360 is a proportion, okay? It's basically the, the length divided by 360, okay? So if we look at this situation where we have two stem walls and we have our, our joists running across and we have a 15 foot span um, running from one wall to another wall, um, we basically have 15 foot of unsupported span here. Um, if the specification is, is L over 360, then you basically look at that length, which is 15 feet. Um, we'll put that in inches because we're gonna measure the, the um, 
the length of or, or the, the amount of deflection in inches. So 15 feet times 12, uh, 12 inches and a foot, that's 180 inches. So we take 180 divided by 360 and that equates to a half inch. So if the specification on this project was L over 360 and we have a, a joist span, unsupported span of 15 feet, then that's allowed to, to deflect no more than a half inch. Um, you know, there's some tiling installations where they call for L over 720, which is even obviously uh, um, you know, a little bit different uh, from a deflection standpoint, okay? You know, kind of looking at this from a um, tiling installation where we're installing tile with a mortar over, over a subfloor here, um, you know, stress from deflection, you know, on the underlayment, the mortar and tile could, could fa cause failure if we're not within the deflection requirements, you know, meaning you got, you know, loads over that floor, you got deflection, uh, the wood uh, moves, deflects too much, and it can cause, you know, tile to despond. So just remember, um, you know, L over 360, that's the length divided by 360. So whatever you're measuring your dimension in, if it's inches, you know, how many inches is that? And then divide that by 360. And you'll see what the maximum deflection can be. Okay, on to underlayments. Um, as we said, underlayment is something that will go over the subfloor, but prior to the installation of the finished flooring. So the underlayment um, is actually also the substrate, okay? Uh, I'm gonna touch on a variety of things here. We'll touch on Luon, we'll touch on Masonite, um, CBU, uh, cementitious backer unit, which is concrete board, uh, the fiber board for installation of tile and stone, uh, medium density fiber board, uh, particle board has an underlayment, uh, but we're gonna uh, focus on finished grade uh, panel underlayment and we will uh, focus a little bit more on self-leveling underlayment as well, but we'll at least touch on uh, the other ones here. So we'll start off with Luon. Um, you go back years ago, this was the, the, the conventional, the traditional standard for underlayment uh, under resilient flooring. Um, you know, this material is, is two thin veneers. It's very smooth, two thin veneers with a thicker core. Um, you know, some people swear by Luon. Um, I, I think most people swear at Luon. Um, sorry, that's that's a joke. So um, I'll, I'll try to stick to my day job. Um, but but seriously, um, I say that because you know Luon has caused some problems uh, over the years. It's a material that comes from the Far East. Uh, there's a, there's a wide variety of um, uh, quality and species that all fall under this classification of Luon. Uh, it's, it's well documented that um, it can contribute to discoloration of resilient materials, um, indentation, uh, if we have um, you know, core issues uh, and, and strength issues with the product, very easily dentable, uh, which shows through the flooring. I've also seen loss of bond and, and delamination. And many flooring manufacturers out there ca commonly caution against the use of Luon. You know, the bottom line here is, um, you know, the finished flooring manufacturer, you know, should be able to, uh, you know, detail the, the types of, uh, you know, wooden underlayments, finished grade wood underlayments to be used with, uh, you know, their floor covering. Okay, so from Luon, we go on to MDF, which is medium density fiber board. Uh, long, narrow wood fibers uh, oriented in really no particular direction at all you know, pressed into place. I mean, the, the, the surface is super smooth um, and it provides a super smooth surface, you know, to install flooring, but it's generally not, you know, designed nor used, uh, you know, for finished floor covering. Uh, masonite, uh, which is a hardboard, um, you know, Masonite, uh, you know, there might be, it's a brand name, it's trademarked, um, uh, there might be other hardboards that look like masonite and, and we call them masonite. Uh, it's kind of like Kleenex, you know, a variety of different Kleenex or tissues out there, but we all call them Kleenex. Um, but, you know, this type of hardboard, um, 
uh, made up of, of wood products and a binder and, and pressed into a very dense board. Uh, it is super smooth, you know, so that it has a smoothness of a, of a great underlayment, but, but again, generally not the, the right type of material for the installation of finished floor covering. Uh, on to particle board. You know, so particle board um, is like kind of sawdust like wood particles uh, with uh, adhesives that are randomly oriented and, and pressed together um, you know, into a very smooth and, and dense panel. Um, the, the Composite Panel Association tests and certifies a particle board. Uh, you have a particle board underlayment stamp panels uh, are, are, are considered underlayment grade. Uh, so there are underlayment grade uh, particle board panels, uh, but number one, you, know, you need to check with the manufacturer of the panel to make sure that that they are suitable for a specific floor covering. And then you should also check with that flooring manufacturer to make sure that that flooring manufacturer is okay uh, with their flooring over that panel. Um, typically, and I say typically because it's not every scenario, but typically um, particle board is you know, is not for uh, fully, adhere, uh, fully adhered resilient floor covering. So again, check with a panel manufacturer, check with the flooring manufacturer to, to be certain. CBU, cementitious backer unit. Uh, this is an underlayment uh, for uh, tile and uh, stone installations, uh, ceramic, quarry, porcelain tile, uh, cultured stone, natural stone, and, and the like. Um, uh, concrete board it's referenced as because it's made of a, a type of concrete product. Um, fiber board uh, because uh, some of them are made up of some sort of cementitious fiber pressed together uh, into a panel. This is providing uh, the base, this is providing the underlayment um, uh, for the installation of tile and stone. Um, these panels um, are commonly three foot by five foot depending on the application, uh, they could, uh, you know, quarter inch thickness would be suitable. Sometimes it's uh, necessary for half inch thick. Um, from an installation standpoint, you're using a thin set mortar, as you see in the left picture here, combing it out onto the substrate, uh, the wooden substrate, dropping the panel um, into place into the wet mortar, uh, working on top of it, screwing it down into place uh, very commonly on an uh, eighth inch, or sorry, eight inches on center. Um, you know, leaving a gap at the joint uh, so that we can use more thin set mortar to, to fill that joint. Um, and then we're using a fiberglass alkali resistant uh, tape designed for specifically for this application uh, that will embed into the fresh setting material and then uh, apply more setting material directly over that tape uh, so that it's encapsulated in, in mortar and bonding, bonding to that um, concrete board or that that uh, fiber board, the, the CBU. One thing I want to point out uh, to you is um, you know, some of the industry uh, guidelines that are out there that you have at your fingertips. And with regard to wooden subfloors, um, you know, there's a lot of good information in here. Um, you have the Tau Council of, Council of North America. There's um, American National Standards Institute um, in Canada. Um, you got the Terrazzo Tile and Mosaic Association of, uh, of Canada, uh, their technical handbook um, gives you guidelines there. Um, I just threw a, a cross section of a, um, a detail for installation of a, a backer board over top of a, a wooden subfloor. You know, they're detailing that um, uh, you got joists that are no more than 16 inches on center. Um, you don't see it in this picture because it was in the wording on a different part of the page, but um, you know, it's three quarter inch plywood. Um, I think depending on the application, it could be five eighths inch plywood. Um, and then uh, backer board or fiber board set in, a, set in a thin set as we just discussed. So I uh, just wanted to make a reference here. Um, you know, these, these documents uh, and there's others out there provide a lot of good information on uh, subfloors. Um, not just for the installation of tile, they have uh, details in there for the installation of leveling materials, um, cementitious leveling materials, gypsum materials, and, and the like. So it's a, it's a good resource. So on to finish grade uh, panel underlayment. Uh, and there's a variety of different uh, ones out there in the industry. Uh, ULA is a, a very uh, uh, well-constructed, uh, uh, engineered 
uh, underlayment. I think uh, you guys see a lot of that up in Canada. Um, in the States, we see a variety of different ones, multiply, tech ply, acuply, shore ply. And, and these are you know, engineered finished grade uh, underlayments specifically designed uh, for the installation of finished floor covering. Okay. Um, you know, you, you can go into a lumber yard or one of the big box stores and, and, you know, you'll see, you know, finished grade plywood, you know, maybe quarter inch thick on the shelf, maybe a four by eight sheet, but that doesn't necessarily, it was, it was designed specifically for the installation of resilient floor covering. So you want to use, you know, a panel um, that is specifically designed for flooring. Um, and then, you know, talk with the, the, the flooring manufacturer to make sure that they're, you know, good with, you know, that type of underlayment with their floor covering, okay? Um, um, from a storage standpoint here, uh, check with the manufacturer of the panel. Um, I've seen recommendations where they say store them flat. I've seen recommendations where they say take them into the, the space and store them on their edge. So check with the manufacturer on how they recommend storing um, uh, the, the, the plywood, uh, the, the engineered um, uh, panel underlayment uh, on site. Um, very common, it's recommended to acclimate that to job site uh, uh, conditions, you know, 48 hours um, you know, prior to the installation uh, so that it can acclimate this, this minimize any type of uh, post-installation shrinkage and or expansion, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, one thing that's very good to do prior to the installation, uh, you have a, you know, a wooden subfloor there that during construction was exposed to the elements. And at this point in time, it's all enclosed in. Uh, we want to look for uh, tests for moisture, see what our moisture percentages are. And uh, it's very common that um, it shouldn't exceed 12% uh, moisture. But always check with manufacturer recommendations uh, to ensure. Uh, follow those uh, recommendations. Uh, Tramex, uh, you know, makes great meters uh, for this type of uh, testing. You know, Wagner is another manufacturer that uh, makes meters for this type of testing. Okay, board spacing. Um, I've seen recommendations both ways. Uh, um, from different manufacturers. And I, I've actually seen recommendations uh, for either of these uh, with a specific manufacturer. Okay, sometimes they say, butt the joint, um, you know, nail it, staple it in a certain pattern and, you know, sand the joint, don't patch. Other times they'll say, leave a, you know, a 16th of an inch gap. Uh, I've heard guys, or I've, I've seen recommendations, they say, take a nickel and put a nickel between it to, to space your boards. Um, nail it or staple it in a, a certain pa uh, fa uh, pattern. Um, the bottom line here is, is follow manufacturer's instructions. If they say to butt the, butt the joints, nail it or staple in a certain pattern, sand the joints and don't patch, then, then that's what you do. Follow those guidelines, okay? They're telling you to, to leave a gap, um, nail it or staple in a certain passion, uh, fashion and patch the joints, then, then that's the route you go. Um, at the walls, we definitely need to allow um, some space there, typically an eighth to a quarter inch at the walls to allow for um, some expansion with temperature and humidity changes, okay? But we can't leave too much space there because we certainly need support for the, the floor covering that's going down. Um, panel, or, panel orientation is, is critical. Um, you know, if these, these sheets are four by eight sheets, then we're uh, going long axis perpendicular to the floor joists. Um, you know, for the greatest floor strength and, and stiffness, okay? Um, the joint should be offset, okay? So we're doing, um, you know, half a panel, you know, staggering the joints, if you will. But we also want to include an offset from the subfloor ends and the subfloor edges. So we don't want an underlayment uh, joint to fall directly on top of uh, any of the ends or edges uh, of the subfloor sheathing that's there, okay? Fastening, a very critical part of the installation, okay? Very common that uh, there's a recommendation to use galvanized uh, chisel point crown staples. 
um, galvanized ring shank, underlayment nails. Um, the bottom line is use what's recommended by that manufacturer. Okay, it's very common that um, you got to set the uh, adjust your um, nail gun uh, so that uh, we're driving uh, these fasteners in uh, roughly about a sixteenth of an inch, so they're slightly recessed. You know, you might have to do some practice nailing on a scrap piece of uh, you know plywood and and the the panel just to dial in your 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 staple gun or your nail gun. But we want to make sure that we're they're recessed and that um, you know, we got 75 to 90 percent penetration into the subfloor. You know, check check those. You know, this is generally speaking. You know, check the manufacturer's recommendations to make sure you're following those. But this is generally the recommendation that I see out there. It's also very common to um, fasten these uh, four inches on center out in the field and then two inches along the edge. But we also want to make sure that we're roughly about a half inch from the the edge of the panel. Okay, so we're not getting too close to the the panel. And another key thing, whether it's a staple or whether it's a nail, we don't want to use a nail or a staple that actually goes through uh, the, the sheathing that's underneath the, the underlayment. Okay, uh, very critical. So you see in the left uh, picture there, you know, the nail is driven through the, the, the subfloor sheathing. We don't want that. Another thing that is equally as important is fastening. Um, a lot of these manufacturers have the, the X's, um, uh, you know, maybe they have some dots uh, on the panel, but it's a not, not a matter of simply just going in a linear pattern, left to right, right to left, left to right, until the whole thing is, is uh, fastened to the subfloor. It's very common that um, you, you'll start in a corner, you know, with your, your underlayment, and you may have a scrap piece of underlayment or two to use uh, as your gap at the walls. I see guys typically do that. They'll have a couple of pieces of scrap underlayment. They put it up against the wall, slide the panel up. You know, they've got, um, they got your quarter inch space at the wall. And then while working actually on the pattern, you know, we're gonna shoot uh, your nails or staples two inches apart, half inch from the ed edge, uh, starting in one corner, going down one axis, and then we go down another axis. So in this picture here on the left, you know, you start at the bottom left and you shoot staples or nails as shown all the way up to the edge of the panel towards the top of the screen. Then we come down to the bottom, bottom left corner where we started. And now we shoot nails or staples all the way to the right. Once we got that done, and we're doing this all while we're working on the panel, okay? Um, once we got that done, we go back to that same uh, access there in the corner and, and we'll shoot a diagonal, um, you know, where the X's are, typically four inches uh, apart. And we're shooting those, um, following those staples in a diagonal pattern all the way down to the opposing uh, corner, as you see in that left picture. Once we've done that, then we go back to our starting point again and just start uh, starting that left bottom corner and nail or staple uh, all the way to the right, um, all the way to the top. You know, as shown with the arrows. That's a very common uh, fastening uh, procedure for each panel. Bottom line is check with your panel manufacturer for, for confirmation. Um, finished grade uh, underlayment here, uh, patching the joints. Um, something to, something to uh, reiterate here is we want to use the finished grade wood underlayment as recommended by the underlayment manufacturer. That product must be suitable for the installation of flooring. And you also want to check with the flooring manufacturer so that we're on the same page. Um, I, I got a clipboard from, from Tarket that it, it's probably 20 to 25 years old, but I thought I always thought it was the coolest thing because I could turn on the back of it and they listed the different underlayment manufacturers that they recommended. You know, so bottom line is use the underlayment um, that's recommended by the flooring manufacturer and make sure that that uh, underlayment is designed for the flooring. Then you install that how the underlayment manufacturer recommends it be installed. Okay, if it requires a patching material, then patch. If they tell you to butt the joint, sand it, and don't patch, then don't patch. Okay. Self-leveling underlayments. Okay, self-leveling underlayments are suitable uh, for over 
uh, most of them, not all of them, but uh, there are a lot of self-leveling underlayments that are suitable for over OSB and plywood subfloors. Um, very common that um, the subfloor sheathing is three quarters of an inch, should be tongue and groove, okay? Exterior rated uh, or exposure one rated. Um, and on joists that are uh, no more than 16 inches on center, okay? From a prep standpoint, you know, you're sanding to clean wood, okay? And you're priming as recommended by the manufacturer. Again, the bottom line is check with the underlayment man, the self-leveling underlayment manufacturer for their recommendations. Now, there's a variety of different self-leveling products out there in the industry. If you look at the top two uh, materials being poured, um, on the left, you see that being installed over a plywood subfloor. You got the joints that are patched so that um, the liquid self-leveling doesn't run through the joints. Subfloor is, uh, is primed, that sheathing, that plywood sheathing is primed. And this material itself here did not require any type of mesh uh, at all. The one on the right, um, also this is over OSB and um, the joints are also patched. The, the floor is, is primed and it does not require um, any type of mesh uh, to make it flexible uh, and to be able to flex with the wood, okay? There's other products out there that may require a lath mesh uh, the diamond lath mesh like you see in the bottom left picture. There's also plastic lath out there that some products require plastic lath of some sort. Um, it gets stapled to the subfloor as you see in the bottom right picture. Okay, there's even some products that may require a liquid additive to make the product more flexible to work with, um, to, to perform over a wooden subfloor. So not all self-leveling products are created equal. There are, um, Several that can be used over wood, not all of them, but several are, uh, and always follow manufacturer's recommendations on how to install that specific product over wood. Um, some of these self-leveling products can be used to encapsulate hydronic tubing or electric heating systems. You see the hydronic tubing in the top picture. Um, in the bottom left picture, you can see the, the electric heating system um, on the floor. And uh, the bottom line here is the floor has to be prepped. It's very common that the floor has to be primed depending on the product. Um, and then when you're pouring the leveling product over this, it, it's, it's very common to pour at least a quarter inch above the hydronic tubes and above the electrical cables. Okay, so that we have good mass of product to be able to perform over top of those cables, over top of those tubes. But the bottom line here is get with manufacturers and follow that manufacturer's recommendations on how to install their product in this capacity. To wrap things up with the presentation here, I wanna spend a few minutes here on the different problems that we see out there um, with finished grade uh, uh, underlayment panels, okay? This is a, a quarter inch material, um, a finished grade, uh, plywood, but not necessarily one that was designed for finished floor covering. And uh, what's happening here is a problem called core gap. And if you look right in the middle of um, the cross section, there, there's basically a, a piece of veneer missing. So, you know, maybe the surface of this ply was smooth enough to put flooring down, but all of the plies weren't uh, of the same quality as the top ply, meaning there's, there's knot holes that are there and those knot holes can create, uh, those knot holes, which is called a core gap, um, can create an indentation ultimately in the uh, finished flooring system. So again, as I said earlier, we gotta make sure that we use the finished grade panel underlayment that is specifically designed for the installation of finished flooring and not just pulling you know, a panel you know, uh, off the lumber, uh, lumber yard shelf that might have a, a smooth surface for flooring, okay? Storage, you know, I, I talked earlier about how we store these. Some say lay them flat, others say stand them up on edge in the environment, you know, standing them up outside like you see here, you know, not, not a good thing. Uh, you know, hope, hopefully that they, you know, this panel was never used as a part of the flooring installation. Single span subfloor issues. You know, I told you earlier that we need the, the subfloor sheathing needs to uh, span at least, it must be a, over at least two spans. This is just over one span. And the problem is, is uh, loads over top of that um, 
you know, has caused uh, the middle uh, to, to recess. And we basically got a cupped board at this point. So they got to remove that and the adjoining, um, you know, pl uh, plywood sheets and, and, and do an installation where we're covering at least two spans. Overspan panels, okay. Uh, common specification, three quarter inch ply or OSB joists that are 16 inches on center. You know, if, if they're overspan, that can lead to deflection issues in between each joist. Okay, but the bottom line here again, follow local building code. Illiteracy, all right, that, that, that's partially a joke, but there is some seriousness to this. Um, there are panels that are, you know, designed. Uh, some veneers are suitable for one side, other veneers are suitable for, you know, the other side. You have a top and a bottom. This specific plywood panel, you know, this side up, okay, we're looking at the underside in between joists and we got uh, copper uh, water supply tubing there and some electrical, you know, running through the joists there. So the bottom line is when it comes to panel sheathing, we got to follow manufacturer's recommendations on installation. Uh, improper fastening can lead to a, a lot of different problems. If you look at the, the, the top picture, uh, they got a couple of fasteners here. You know, for finished grade wood underlayment, we're talking every two inches on the seam, you know, uh, four inches in the field. Um, you look at the bottom picture uh, and it shows what can happen ultimately if we're not fastened right. Uh, we can get some buckling uh, as you see in the bottom picture. So fastening is critical. Follow manufacturer's instructions with regard to fastening that finished grade underlayment. Um, in addition to Im improper uh, fastening here, um, it's, it's quite simply not the right plywood for the installation of floor covering. Uh, you see all the patching that had to be done on here that 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 wasn't a you know finished grade you know wood underlayment for the, the installation of finished flooring uh, so you got multiple things going on here it's not the right panel uh, required a lot of patching it was never designed for the installation of finished flooring and uh, i guess the good thing is they they didn't uh, fasten it right so that'll make it easier to tear out uh, less fasteners makes uh, tear out a lot easier Uh, another improper installation uh, issue, uh, uh, gapping, uh, too large a gap uh, in the panel. Uh, remember, some of these finished grade panels, they call for them butting the joints, sanding them and not patching. Others, it might be a 16th of an inch gap, but follow manufacturer's uh, recommendations. Um, installation issue again, okay, we're supposed to have uh, you know, roughly a quarter inch uh, at the wall. Uh, maybe on the bottom right of the picture where that uh, underlayment grade panel is meeting the wall, you know, maybe you're within spec there, but if you look at it around the door jam and around the return wall by the door jam, it's, it's just simply unacceptable. I mean, there's, there's nothing to support the floor covering in that installation. You know, you always got a little bit of play with uh, some base that's going up, you know, things like that, but you know, this is, uh, you know, just unacceptable here. Um, level, level and flat, or I should say flatness, not level, uh, flatness. Um, always check with the flatness specifications for the floor covering going down. It might be a, an eighth inch allowable in a 10 foot uh, span. It might be a 3 16 inch gap over a 10 foot span as an acceptable uh, maximum uh, flatness tolerance. But the bottom line here is we have to correct flatness issues with the subfloor prior to installing the finished grade underlayment. If you simply just install the underlayment, in theory, all you've done is raise the floor a quarter of an inch. You haven't corrected any of the issues. You know, in small areas, we can, we can fix some depressions with uh, some trial grade uh, products that uh, can be stapled through. But if there's significant leveling that's needed, um, you know, we can't, we, we can't install a self leveling over the whole floor and then expect to nail or staple an underlayment you know, through the self-leveling, or we can't expect to nail a three-quarter um, solid wood floor, you know, to a self-leveling. 
Um, so keep that in mind. Um, if we need to level, and you know, they originally had to, we we're looking at putting a finished grade one underlayment down, as seen in the picture here. You know, we could, uh, if the floor was that bad, you, you would just simply use the self leveling to create the flatness and smoothness required, and then install the floor covering over top of that. Again, uh, the bottom line here, uh, be disciplined, do it right every time. And I think we got a little, some extreme discipline going on in that picture. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, your time today. I appreciate you uh, spending some time uh, with us this afternoon. And um, I'm certainly open it up for questions at this point.